Chapter 1 Dublin, Ireland July 2nd ND, 1922 The sound of sporadic gunfire echoing through the narrow streets of Dublin sounded to ten-year-old Patrick Murphy like the rolling thunder from a summer storm brewing somewhere in the distance. Patrick peered around the corner and saw that the street was deserted. With a smile on his dirt-smeared face, he realized that his luck was holding. For days, Irishmen fought one another, as soldiers from both the Irish Republican Army and the Provisional Government battled for control of Dublin. Patrick looked back over his shoulder and waved to his brother, sitting behind the wheel of a borrowed, white-paneled truck, Odell's Butcher Shop emblazoned on the sides in large blue lettering. A moment later, Liam, Patrick's older brother, waved back and drove to the corner before stopping to let him climb back on board. Sitting beside his brother was a man they had only met this morning. He wore a long, gray trench coat and a cap pulled down low on his head. The man had short red hair and a stern-looking face. His name was Mr. Lewis, or so he said, and that was all they needed to know. On the floor of the truck sat a large, battered wooden box, with one of Mr. Lewis' legs resting on top. His constant fidgeting with the pistol in his hands made Patrick uneasy. He had seen weapons before, as his older brother was a volunteer with the government militia, but their passenger seemed nervous, as if expecting something to happen. Slowly, they drove out of the city, making their way past a couple of heavily armed police checkpoints, where officers were busy looking for gunrunners and IRA sympathizers. After driving for an hour, they approached the outskirts of Old Kana village, and Mr. Lewis told them to turn off the paved road and into an empty farmer's field. Parking the truck, Lewis ordered Liam and Patrick to remain in the cab while he stepped outside to conduct his business. Lewis took the heavy wooden box in his arms, climbed out of the truck, walked out into the middle of the open field, put the box down, and lit a cigarette, standing there as if he were waiting for a train to come by and pick him up from the middle of nowhere. Patrick looked over at his older brother, who seemed relieved to be free of their mysterious passenger, even if only for a short while. What's the fella doing? asked Patrick. Liam shrugged. I haven't the foggiest clue. I was told to drive Mr. Lewis wherever he wanted, and to not bloody well get caught doing it. That's all I know, Patrick me boy, aside from the fact that I'm getting 50 pounds for a few hours work. Patrick may have been a young boy, but he knew his family did not always entirely operate within the law. His father and oldest brother were in prison and, for all his youth, he somehow knew that someday he would be, too. After a half hour of waiting and staring at Mr. Lewis sitting on his box, Patrick heard the sound of an engine in the distance, gradually growing louder as it drew closer. Rolling down the window, Patrick stuck his head out and looked into the sky. Gray clouds hung low, blocking out the sun. Patrick turned his head and was surprised to see an aircraft emerge out of the clouds like a hawk diving. Out of the sky after its prey. It was unlike any other he had ever seen in his life. It was a monoplane, with a single engine mounted in the nose of the craft, painted all white, except for a long, red streak that extended all the way down the fuselage. Also seeing the plane, Lewis stood and waved his arms in the air. A moment later, the plane banked over in an almost leisurely fashion, and lined itself up with the farmer's field. Patrick could barely contain himself, he had never seen a plane so close before. He went to leave the cab, when his brother firmly grabbed him by the arm and pulled him back inside. Liam's eyes narrowed, telling him that he had best stay put. With a huff, Patrick sat back on the bench as the plane swooped down and landed in the pasture. The pilot looks like he's done this before, thought Patrick, with his eyes glued to the aircraft. Movement caught Patrick's eye, and he watched as Lewis stood up, threw his cigarette onto the ground, grabbed the wooden box, and waited for the plane to come to a complete stop. The plane's engine remained on, ostensibly to be ready to take off at a moment's notice. Patrick chafed at being cooped up inside the cab of the truck when all the excitement was going on outside. 
He thrust his head out the open window and watched as Lewis walked over to the idling plane. A door on the side of the craft opened, and out stepped a beautiful woman with long, golden blonde hair. She was wearing a green leather jumpsuit with a gray fur collar. Seeing Lewis, she stepped down and waited while he opened the box. The woman peered quickly inside. She looked back over her shoulder and called out. A thick-necked man with broad shoulders climbed out of the airplane, took the box from Lewis, and handed him an identical one in return. Without saying a word, Lewis moved back from the plane, the new box clenched firmly in his hands. The woman and the large man turned and climbed back inside the plane, closing the door behind them. The plane's engine grew loud as it began to taxi down the field. Bouncing once or twice on the uneven ground, the plane slowly lifted off and flew into the clouds and out of sight, as if it had never been there at all. Now remember this, Patrick, if ever asked, you never saw a thing today, okay, said Liam, his voice full of warning as Mr. Lewis walked back to the truck. Patrick nodded, all the while wishing he could have gotten a closer look at the plane. Lewis walked over to Liam's side of the truck and, without uttering a word, he handed him the wooden box. Reaching over, Liam grabbed hold of the box. He placed it down on the floor of the truck, sat up and turned back to Lewis. Patrick watched, frozen in horror, as Lewis thrust a pistol through the window of the cab. Before anyone could move, or even speak, the man fired. Blood and gore spattered the windshield, the sound of the gun discharging inside the cab was deafening. The roar spurred Patrick into action. His heart pounded like a jackhammer inside his chest as he spun about in his seat, fumbling to open the door. The windshield exploded beside him, showering him with sharp shards of glass. With his heart racing away in his chest, Patrick shoved the door open and spilled out of the truck. He hit the ground running. He needed to get away and find a place to hide. Spotting an apple orchard barely a hundred yards away, he sprinted as fast as he could toward it. Tears streamed down his face as he ran. Another shot split the air. Patrick felt the bullet pass by his head. The trees loomed large. With one last burst of speed, he reached the orchard. Without looking back to see where Lewis was, he ran deep into the woods, desperately seeking a hiding place. His foot caught on something, and Patrick fell head over heels, tumbling down onto the wet ground. A voice called out, frighteningly near, give yourself up, you little bastard, and I'll make it quick. Patrick did not intend to give himself up. Quickly looking around, he saw a thick stand of bush nearby. Scrambling on all fours, he dove under the scrub and lay there, frozen in place. He fought to control his ragged breathing, fearful that Lewis would hear him, find him, and kill him. A moment later, Patrick could see a pair of feet. Lewis stopped where he was and looked around, searching for his quarry. Patrick fought back another wave of tears and the terror in his heart. He knew if he made a sound, he would be as dead as his brother. How was he going to tell his mother that Liam had been murdered? With her husband and eldest son in jail, they relied on Liam for income. With him gone, too, they would be penniless. I know you're around here somewhere, called out Lewis. All day, you little bastard. Show yourself. The man's feet approached his hiding spot. Did Lewis know where he was? Patrick jammed his hands over his mouth, he was afraid to make a sound. You're lucky I have to be somewhere, or you'd be as dead as your brother, yelled Lewis. You had better not say a thing, because if I ever hear that you did, so help me God, I will track you down and put a bullet between both your and your mother's eyes, snarled Lewis. No, pleaded Patrick silently. The feet turned and began to walk away. Patrick lay under the bushes, waiting, silent and afraid. A moment later, the sound of the truck starting startled him. He continued to lay there, his heart still racing. He soon heard the truck driving away back down the road they had come up earlier. 
Patrick waited until he could not hear the truck anymore before crawling out from his hiding place. Looking down, he saw that he was covered with a horrifying mash of blood, gore, and dirt, and had also soiled himself. As he walked back to where he had last seen his brother, Patrick's feet felt like they were made of lead. Each footstep was labored and hard. He did not want to see what had happened to Liam, but he had to know. As though in a trance, he walked to where they had parked in the open field. A bloodied shape lay face down in the grass. Patrick could no longer hide his sorrow, and he let out a mournful wail as he dashed over to his brother. He dropped down to his knees. Patrick hesitated, before slowly reaching over and grabbing his brother by his shoulders, pulling the lifeless body into his arms. He sobbed uncontrollably as he held on tight to his brother. He wondered what had been in the box, and why someone would kill to keep it a secret. It was a question that would haunt him for the rest of his life. Chapter 2 Northwest Africa June 10th th, 1931 Like some kind of ancient, monstrous creature breaching the waves, the royal airship Goliath floated up through the thin, gray evening clouds. Her skin shone silvery white, reflecting the light of the brilliant full moon hanging high in the night sky. Shadowy and almost spectral, the massive craft left the wispy tendrils of the clouds behind, and steadily climbed into the dark embrace of the night sky. The Goliath was the latest, and most expensive, showpiece vessel of Lord Angus Seaford, a blunt, Scottish, self-made multimillionaire who had a singular vision that trade throughout the British Empire would one day be by air, not by sea. He envisioned a world where fleets of airships, owned by him, would fly their goods and passengers all across the British Empire, from London to New Delhi to Cape Town, and back again. Trade and control over the seas were what gave Britain an unrivaled empire over which the sun never set. Seaford saw a new realm in the air, and he wanted to be the man to control it all. His growing passion, or obsession, some would say, had driven him to take the costly risk of financing the building of the airship out of his own pocket, to the unheard of tune of almost three and a half million pounds sterling. The craft was the largest ever built in England. It measured over 250 yards long and had a 45-man crew, all of whom were veterans of the burgeoning airship business. The Goliath was propelled, at a steady 100 kilometers an hour, by five powerful eight-cylinder diesel engines, each mounting 16-foot, solid oak twin-blade propellers. Nestled comfortably within the craft were 60 luxurious passenger cabins, and an elegant, five-star dining room that served meals rivaling any found in Paris or London. There were two promenade decks with windows running down both sides of the airship, allowing passengers a view unlike anything anyone had ever seen before. There was even a spacious lounge and an asbestos-lined smoking room, where Lord Seaford would entertain guests after the five-course evening meal. As it was in English society, most of the passenger space was on the upper deck, with the kitchen, washrooms, and crew accommodation below. Much of the inner workings of the craft were located out of sight on the lower deck. The massive airship was steered from the control car located well forward under the lower deck, which was only accessible by a ladder that led down from the chart room. Goliath spared nothing for the comfort of its privileged passengers. Seaford had ensured that all of the major media outlets throughout the country were on hand to cover the maiden launch of Great Britain's pride, the Goliath, as it took off from southern England to the cheering adulation of thousands of well-wishers. Revving its mighty engines to full power, the Goliath turned away from her home and floated off into the bright summer sky. Crossing over the English Channel, accompanied by several intrepid flyers hired by the papers to record the event, the Goliath headed for its first stop in Paris, where Lord Seaford and his amazing airship were the toast of the town. After only one short night's stay, several new passengers joined the flight. They then flew on to Rome, where a crowd of thousands of onlookers cheered as the Goliath moored itself on the outskirts of the city. With an eye on showing them world what could be accomplished from the air, 
Seaford harried the ship's captain to continue with their voyage. After only a brief stop to refuel, the Goliath soon continued on her journey and traveled south, out over the warm, blue waters of the Mediterranean Sea. It headed toward its next destination, Nouakchott, the capital of Mauritania, in French West Africa. Their final destination was Cape Town, South Africa. Once there, Seaford had told the press that he intended to hold a news conference, and announced to the world his plans for a fleet of airships that would become the new vessels of commerce for the 20th century and beyond. Inside the airship's control cabin, Captain William Wright stood, watching with his steely blue eyes as the duty officer gave an order. The ship's helmsman acknowledged the order, then spun the wheel over to starboard, steering the Goliath southwest toward the small French military airstrip, still many miles distant. Captain Wright was considered by his employer to be a steady end. Dependable captain, a man who never failed to bring his ship, cargo, and crew home safely. His blue, naval-style uniform looked as crisp and clean as when he had dressed earlier that morning. A stickler for dress and discipline, Captain Wright believed in setting an example for his much younger crew to follow. He was always first on shift in the morning, and the last senior officer to leave at night. Wright rested his hand on the side of the wooden cabin, he could feel the powerful rhythmic vibration of the engines. Somewhat superstitious, Captain Wright always felt that it was good luck to touch his craft and feel the power of his vessel before turning over the duties and responsibilities to the night duty officer. A smile crept across his weathered face. It may have been the maiden voyage of the Goliath, but it was Wright's final duty call. After having held an illustrious 45-year career, he was planning to retire. Mr. Young, said Wright, as he looked down at his gold pocket watch and then over at the slender junior officer standing beside him. It is now midnight, you have the ship. I expect you to wake me should the need arise. Lieutenant Young respectfully raised his hand to his cap. I, sir, I have the ship, he replied. Captain Wright patted the young officer on the shoulder and climbed up the ladder into the darkened chart room. Straightening out his tunic before stepping out onto the main passageway that ran like a long metal spine throughout the body of the airship, Wright looked aft toward the crew's quarters. He thought about having a quick walkthrough to see how the men were doing before turning in for the night, but instead, decided to make his way up to the passenger deck and the lounge. He had no doubt that Lord Seaford and several of his equally rich friends would still be playing cards and drinking the night away. It was none of Wright's business what his employer did, but he could tell that. Seaford was gambling and drinking far more on this flight than any other time that they had traveled together before. Wright clasped his hands behind his back and started walking down the dimly lit corridor, when the hair on the back of his neck rose something was wrong. His blood turned cold in his veins when he heard the unmistakable sound of a pistol firing. Who the hell was firing a gun on board a vessel filled with massive, highly flammable hydrogen cells? It was sheer madness. Another shot fired. Right, his heart pounding away in his chest, looked down the corridor and watched a dark shape stumble out of a room and tumble onto the carpeted floor. Fighting the fear gripping his stomach, Captain Wright ran over to the body lying face down on the floor. A dark stain of blood was already seeping out from underneath the man. Slowly, Wright turned the body over, and saw that it was his junior radio operator, a bloody hole now blasted into the poor man's chest. After laying the body back down, Wright stood and cautiously walked toward the open radio room. He stopped at the door. Wright could hear the sound of someone inside, smashing things to pieces. It was as if the man did not care if anyone heard him. Wright summoned up his courage, took a deep breath, stepped inside the door, and froze in disbelief. Standing there, with an axe grasped tightly in his hands, was Lord Seaford. His red hair was a mess and his deep green eyes were ablaze with a maniacal look. My God, sir, what are you doing? asked Wright, as he looked around at the destroyed radio equipment. I'm sorry, Captain, mumbled Seaford. I had to do it. I had to do what? 
needed to be done. Not a word of it made any sense to write, as he edged forward, his hands at his sides. In a calm tone, Wright said, what needed to be done, sir? Seaford suddenly raised the axe above his head. Stay where you are, Captain, he screamed, spittle flying from his mouth. I've already killed tonight. Don't make me kill you, too. The ghastly image of the dead radio operator filled Wright's mind. His fear faded as anger swelled inside his chest. Had the man gone mad? Easy now, sir, said Wright, trying to get the lunatic to lower his axe. Why don't you tell me what the problem is, and I'll see what I can do about it. It's too late for that now, sobbed Seaford, as tears welled up in his bloodshot eyes. No one can know what has happened here. Wright inched forward. A flicker of sadness registered in Seaford's eyes. The axe lowered slightly. In a flash, Wright launched himself at Seaford, grabbing. The axe in his hands. The two men tumbled from side to side inside the tiny room. Wrestling for control of the deadly weapon. Wright was the larger of the two, but Seaford fought back like a man possessed by a demon. Back and forth the men staggered, smashing into overturned chairs while destroyed radio components crunched under their feet. What the hell is going on in here, yelled a voice from outside. A crewman stepped inside, saw what was going on and without hesitation, threw himself into the fight. Seaford struggled in vain as the two men soon overpowered him, the taken from his hands. Captain Wright, his heart still beating wildly, ordered the crewman to tie Seaford up. A minute later, with Seaford firmly tied to a chair, the crewman headed off to wake the sleeping master-at-arms so he could break out a pistol and a set of handcuffs from the airship's tiny armory. Captain Wright put the axe down on a far table, then removed his tunic, and placed it over the body of the unfortunate radio operator. Saying a quick prayer. For the man, Wright turned and looked toward Seaford, surprised to see tears streaming down the man's face. Sir, pull yourself together. What the devil is going on here? Asked Wright, shaking his head at his employer, who looked like a broken man. Seaford said nothing, meekly lowering his head in shame. Wright bit his lip in anger and frustration. What could have possibly made Seaford want to kill a defenseless man and try to stop any communication of the event? A sudden chill ran down Wright's spine. He walked out from the room and looked down the long passageway toward the back of the airship. A low rumble echoed throughout the Goliath, followed a second later by a violent explosion that rocked the massive airship from side to side, throwing right off his feet and onto the floor of the radio room. Struggling to rise, the captain did not need to be told what had happened. Somewhere in the bowels of the ship a catastrophic explosion had just occurred, and Wright knew who had caused it. Looking over at Seaford, he knew the man was mad and had doomed them all. A ghastly wall of fire and destruction raced from the tail section of the airship, picking up speed as it shot forward, instantly breaching and tearing apart the gas cells that held hundreds of thousands of feet of highly flammable hydrogen. Like a fiery creature bursting from the pits of hell, the bright orange wall of flame consumed all in its path. Captain Wright clenched his fists in frustration and anger. He knew that it would be mere seconds before the Goliath would lose its structural integrity and begin its death spiral toward the ground, thousands of meters below. Already, the once proud airship had begun to list forward, tilting its nose. Downward. What the hell have you done, yelled Wright, as the horrible noise of the craft tearing itself apart filled his ears. Seaford raised his head, looked into Wright's eyes, and mouthed one word, sorry. An instant later, scorching flames ripped through the cabin, incinerating Wright and Seaford. Far below, a massive sandstorm whipped across the desolate and rocky terrain, while burning debris rained down from the night sky like a bright, unexpected meteor shower. The Goliath plummeted to Earth, her crew and passengers lost in the vast expanse of Africa for decades to come. Chapter 3 
the Philippines present day the sun slowly crept below the green hills surrounding a small camp nestled against the banks of the swollen Cagayan River. Long shadows slid along the ground, soon covering the encampment, as the once bright world turned to dusk. With night approaching, the jungle slowly came to life. Creatures called to one another, filling the air with a cacophony of noise. Jennifer March stepped out of the large, green, military-style tent that she and several other people had been using as a makeshift office. She paused, with her hands on her hips, and took in the symphony of the night before running a hand through her short, caramel-colored hair. She was reminded that she hadn't had a decent shower in over a week, and was not likely to get another one for a few more. Baggy, khaki-colored shorts and a loose-fitting shirt hit her lithe physique. After brushing some dirt off her arms, Jen began to wonder if she would ever feel clean again. Just shy of 30, Jennifer March had recently thrown herself into her work. With a renewed passion and vigor to avoid having to deal with the messy implosion of her two-year relationship with an older colleague. It had been comfortable at first, but ultimately it was doomed. Jen wanted to know that it was going somewhere her boyfriend would always avoid the issue whenever she raised it. One day, six months ago, she'd had enough. She packed her bags, moved back in with her mother in Charlotte, North Carolina, and refused to talk with anyone about her decision to leave. At the expense of everything else, her work had now become the only focus in her life. Three months ago, a local farmer who was clearing the land along the riverbank to plant crops for his family stumbled upon the mangled wreckage of what could only be an old military transport plane. After many calls to the authorities and various scholars, the plane was identified by a professor from the University of Luzon. The wreckage was unmistakably the remains of an old U.S. Dakota transport plane that had crashed sometime during the Second World War. Having lost numerous planes to probable mechanical breakdowns or enemy action during the war over the Philippines, the U.S. State Department financed the dig. They were eager to identify the exact plane and to repatriate the remains of any U.S. servicemen killed in the crash. Forensic archaeology was far from Jen's field of expertise, but when the original team leader went down with appendicitis a day before the team of grad students was scheduled to leave, Jen volunteered to step up but only if she was allowed time off from teaching to write a book about their findings. When they arrived in the capital of Luzon, Jen and her gang of a dozen graduate students was met at the airport by her counterpart on the dig, Professor Carlos Laurel. Laurel was a large and jovial man who wore pop bottle glasses and a constant smile on his broad face. Jen and Laurel instantly hit it off, and a strong bond soon developed between the two disparate groups of students living and working shoulder to shoulder in the heat and humidity of the Philippine jungle. Her stomach rumbled loudly, reminding Jen that once again she had worked straight through lunch. She turned in the direction of the communal mess, walked over, and joined a short lineup that consisted of local workers mixed in. With Filipino and American grad students, all loudly chatting away like a gang of old friends. When she saw the meal, she cringed. Chicken, rice, and steamed vegetables. Again. With a weak smile on her face, Jen grabbed her food and found a seat in the far corner of the mess tent. A small black notebook from a pocket in her shorts, and reviewed her day's work while she picked away at her unexciting meal. May I join you, said a voice with a strong Filipino accent. Professor Laurel stood beside Jen's table, with a heaping tray of food. With a quick smile, she motioned for him to join her. A good day, wouldn't you say, said Laurel, as he chewed a heaping forkful of rice. Oh yes, very much so, Jen replied, thumbing through her notebook. The serial numbers on the engine block will identify which missing plane it could possibly be. I emailed the photos taken this afternoon of the engine, along with its serial number, to the Department of Defense. I suspect that by tomorrow morning, we should have a flight manifest of those U.S. and Filipino service personnel who are still listed as missing on the flight. From there, we can go about expanding the search for the remains, if any have survived this long. 
The jungle is not too kind on the dead. If the local animals did not cart off the remains after the crash, then they would have decomposed very quickly in this humid climate. For the family's sake, I hope we do find something that can be returned home and buried with some dignity, said Laurel. Jen thought about Laurel's words for a moment. Amen to that. She was about to go over her thoughts about the next day's dig with Laurel, when a small, lean, bespectacled Asian-American girl wearing a tight-fitting Lady Gaga world. Tour t-shirt walked over to their table, holding a plate with nothing but vegetables on it. Can I join you too, or is this not business talk, asked Alanis Kim, looking down at the empty spot at the table. Jen shrugged her shoulders, Laurel did not even bother to look up from his food. Kim slipped down onto the chair and cleaned her cutlery with a napkin. Before cutting up some broccoli. Oh, I hope I wasn't intruding, she said. Jen shook her head. She had noticed that Kim had an overly active imagination, and had become the de facto team gossip. Nothing escaped her vigilance. An innocent smile or friendly wave at an associate was instantly turned into the latest romance or secret affair between seemingly unconnected colleagues, all of which was recorded and posted on Facebook and Twitter for the world to read. You should really slow down when you eat, Kim lectured, as she watched Laurel clean his plate until not a scrap remained. A loud belch escaped Laurel's mouth. He patted his belly and smiled over at the horrified student. You should eat more, said Laurel. You might be able to attract a man if you put some weight on. I like my women with a bit of meat on them. Kim scrunched up her nose at the thought. I guess that takes Professor March out of the equation, then. Kim, really, admonished Jen, shaking her head at the graduate students. Inappropriate remarks. I have a beautifully round girlfriend waiting for me in Manila, said Laurel, with a warm, unconcerned smile on his face. I'm going to get a coffee and perhaps some cake. Can I get you two beautiful ladies anything, he asked, rising from the creaking table. Both women asked for a cup of green tea, but no cake. Laurel nodded and went off to fetch the order. A moment later, Laurel returned and handed a piece of cake heaped with icing to Kim with a smile on his face that said, you had better enjoy it. They spent the rest of the evening discussing the next day's plans and goals. Feeling fatigued, Jen turned in early and was out seconds after her head hit the pillow. The next morning began like any other. There was a quick, chaotic breakfast of coffee and scrambled eggs, followed immediately by the daily brief from Professor Laurel on the activities ahead, which to Jen always seemed more like a sermon. After that, the students broke down into their respective teams and went about the painstaking work of carefully excavating the crash site. As Jen had predicted, an email was waiting on her computer in the morning from the DoD. It was the manifest of the doomed flight known by its call sign, Whiskey 35. Jen skimmed the document and saw that seven American and five Filipino servicemen had been on the plane when it disappeared over the jungle on March 3, 1945. The plane had been bound for Manila, but when it failed to arrive on time, a search was initiated. After two weeks of fruitless effort, the search was called off, and the plane was officially listed as missing. That was, until today. Jen smiled to herself, things were going as planned. She quickly printed off a couple of copies of the flight manifest, one for herself, the other for Professor Laurel and stepped out from the dingy tent into the bright morning sunlight. She slipped on a pair of sunglasses and headed off into the already humid morning to look for Laurel and share her news. The crash site was marked off with yellow barrier tape, in the rough shape of an airplane. All around the dig, students and local workers toiled side by side, most had grown used to the stifling heat and humidity that seemed to envelop the site throughout the long day. Jen soon found Laurel, his head down, looking over some mangled remains that vaguely looked like a plane steering wheel. She looked at the bent wheel and wondered how the men had felt in the last seconds before the crash, knowing they were going to die. A cold shiver ran down her spine. Shaking the morbid thoughts from her mind, 
Jen handed Laurel a copy of the flight manifest. Together, they began to discuss the next step in trying to find the crew's remains, when an excited voice called out. Jen and Laurel trotted over to the site of the commotion. A group of students and locals were huddled around a shallow hole. Gently prying the people apart, Jen and Laurel stepped down into the depression. The smell of freshly dug earth wafted in the air. What do you have there, Joseph? Laurel said to one of his students. Professor, I found this, said the student, as he held up a pair of rusty-looking military identification discs. Laurel took them in his large hand and reverently examined the discs. Where exactly did you find these, asked Laurel, his voice serious. Right here, sir, said Joseph, pointing to a recently uncovered patch of dark earth. Laurel bent over, his large frame blocking the dig from view. Putting more dirt aside, Laurel found a pair of broken glasses embedded in the earth. He picked them up and stared down at the distorted shape. My god, do you think we have found one of our missing soldiers, asked. Jen, peering down at the objects in Laurel's meaty hand. Laurel stood and looked around at the anxious crowd of students peering at him. These items belonged to one Sergeant Thomas Henry. He is one of the crewmen listed as missing on the flight manifest, so we have the first evidence of remains from the crash. Now, the real work begins. A murmur raced through the crowd of onlookers. What are you all doing standing around and gawking, said Laurel with a huff, as he helped himself out of the hole. Come on, everyone, there's still plenty of work to be done before the sun goes down tonight. With that, the crowd broke up and everyone went back to work, excitedly discussing the find. Laurel reverently handed Jen the dirt-covered items and headed off to supervise another part of the dig. Jen stood there, staring down at the mangled pieces of metal in her hand, and wondered who Sergeant Henry was, and if he still had any living relatives. Back in the States. She was about to return to her tent to catalog the find when. The sound of automatic gunfire tore through the air. Jen flinched at the noise and turned to look in the direction of the shots. Screams filled the air. A young man, his hand held to a bloody wound on his head staggered past Jen. His eyes were full of terror. More gunfire suddenly erupted from another direction. Jen froze in her tracks. She did not know which way to turn. People were panicking all around her, running, screaming, and crying as they were forced toward the center of the camp. A man wearing an ill-fitting camouflage uniform emerged from behind a tent and fired a burst into the air. With a crooked smile, he walked forward, a rusted AK-47 clenched tightly in his hands. You, that way, yelled the man at Jen, as he pointed toward the camp's mess tent. Jen stood there, wide-eyed, staring down the barrel of the still-smoking AK. Now, said the man, raising the assault rifle until it was aimed at Jen's head. Jen instantly snapped out of her stupor and darted for the mess tent. Stumbling over the body of one of their local workers, a ragged bloody hole in his back. Her mind shrieked in horror at the sight, but Jen fought to stifle a scream as she joined the mass of sobbing and terrified students corralled in the mess tent. A minute after it had begun it was all over. An uneasy silence filled the camp. Jen sat at a crowded table like everyone else, her hands were locked together on top of her head. It was truly an uncomfortable position, but Jen dared not move. The last student who did got a rifle butt to the head for his troubles. Jen saw that the men guarding them were mainly dressed in rags and old uniforms, and wondered if they were anti-government rebels. She was confused, she had been told the area was safe. Surreptitiously looking around, Jen searched for Professor Laurel. He wasn't among them. She closed her eyes and silently prayed that somehow, he had managed to get away to warn the authorities. A moment later, her hopes were crushed as a dead body was dragged along the red dirt path between the rows of tents, a hole blasted in its skull. Jen's heart skipped a beat when she saw that it was Laurel. A couple of younger girls screamed and broke out crying at the sight of the professor's blood-stained body. 
Jen bit her lip. She had to do something, but what? She was at a loss, she had never been so scared in her entire life, but she knew that somehow she had to fight the fear and stay calm. With this many American and Filipino students in one place together, someone would inevitably be coming to help them, she hoped. And doors opened. A man in immaculately pressed camouflage fatigues entered the tent. He stood a solid six feet tall, with wide, powerful shoulders, short blonde hair, and unforgiving, dark blue eyes. A cold-blooded killer's eyes, thought Jen. This was a man to be feared. He was unlike the others, they were Filipino, while he was white and looked European to Jen. The man stopped in front of the frightened group, dug out his cell phone from his pocket and made a quick call. Once done, he put the phone away and fished out a piece of paper. Good day. My name is David Teplov, and you are all now under my protection. There has been some trouble in the local area, and I have been dispatched to bring you all to a safe location, said the man in Russian accented English. But you murdered Professor Laurel, protested one of the local workers. If you speak another word, I will make sure that you join him, Teplov replied, with a cold, lizard-like smile, as he looked out over the crowd of terrified faces. The once defiant worker turned his head away and tried hiding behind a student. Now, let's all be civil about this. I want to see Miss Jennifer March, said Teplov. Fear gripped Jen's stomach. Why did they want her and not someone else? For a moment, no one moved. Teplov looked over the crowd and shook his head. With lightning fast. Reflexes, he drew a Russian made, MP, 446 9mm semi automatic pistol, walked straight to Alanis Kim, and jammed the gun into the petrified girl's face. Stand up now, or I will blow this girl's brains all over the ground, snarled Teplov. Kim whimpered in fear and tried to pull her face away from the cold barrel pressed against her glistening forehead. Teplov tightened his grip. Kim screamed. Jen stood, staring at the killer. I'm Jennifer March. Please don't hurt her. I'm begging you. You have me. Now please, put your pistol away. Teplov smiled as he slowly pulled his pistol away from Kim's terrified face, placed it back in its holster, and looked over at Jen. There now, that's better. What could you possibly want with me, said Jen, looking around at the worried faces of the students and locals alike. That is not important right now. I have a vehicle waiting at the edge of the camp for you, said Teplov with a wave of his hand. As for the others, they will be joining you shortly, once a couple more of my trucks arrive. Jen stood there, not believing a word. The look in the killer's cold eyes told her that he could not be trusted. She could not just leave the students there, they were all looking to her for leadership, now that Professor Laurel was dead. She tried playing for time, hoping that by some miracle, someone would come and help them. I have your word that my people will be unharmed if I come with you. Jen asked, as she locked eyes with Teplov. Miss March, I have not given you my word, not once, but if it will make you come with me, then you have it, Teplov said, an artificial smile on his face. Jen knew she had no choice. Even though she felt as if she were condemning everyone to certain death, she nodded. She walked out of the tent without saying another word, Teplov motioning her to an idling, beat-up, old-looking, military-style Humvee. A couple more Humvees sat waiting at the far end of the camp. A young man wearing a red beret, green shorts and nothing else. Opened the rear passenger door of the lead Humvee. Jen felt the man's leering. Gaze. She ignored the mercenary and held her head high as she silently climbed into the back of the vehicle. Teplov barked some orders in Tagalog, the local language, to the men guarding the students, and climbed in the passenger side of the vehicle. He looked back at his hostage. Hang on, the road out of here is a little bumpy, he said with a grin. Jen stared back at him, she might have been scared out of her mind, 
but there was no way that she was going to let him see it in her eyes. She crossed her arms over her chest and sat back with as defiant of a look on her face as she could muster. Teplov laughed loudly, turned around, and motioned to his driver to go. As the vehicle slowly left camp, Jen looked out of the window at the people. She was leaving behind. She prayed that Teplov would keep his word and not. Anyone else, but deep down, Jen knew that he was probably going to kill. Them all. Chapter 4 High above the dig site, like an eagle soaring on the winds, a tiny, almost, invisible, unmanned aerial vehicle, or UAV, turned and began to follow a small convoy of vehicles as it snaked its way along the bumpy red dirt road. Painted ghost gray to blend in with the sky, the UAV was nearly impossible to see. It flew along, silently watching, its high-tech cameras sending a feed directly to a laptop computer over 20 kilometers away. Jen March sat in the back of the Humvee, holding on tight as it bounced up and down the rough track that passed as the local highway. She bit her lip and blinked away tears. Jen could not fathom why anyone would want to kidnap her for ransom. Neither she nor anyone in her family had any real money. It was baffling. Who would be so monstrous as to plan to kill 70 students and locals just to cover her abduction? Feeling thoroughly despondent, she was about to hunker down deeper into her hard seat, when out of the corner of her eye she saw a vehicle burst out of the thick jungle, like some charging metal rhinoceros. An instant later, with a loud crunch of compacting metal, it smashed headlong into the side of the closest Humvee behind them, sending it spinning off the road and into the tropical forest. Nate Jackson held the vehicle's steering wheel tight in his large hands. The impact of hitting the Humvee at over 50 kilometers an hour had instantly crumpled the Land Rover's engine bumper guards and shaken up Jackson and his passenger. Quickly spinning the wheel around in his hands, Jackson turned the vehicle onto the road, only a few meters behind their target. Aren't you glad we were wearing seatbelts, quipped Jackson's passenger. I hope they weren't, Jackson replied, with a wide grin on his face. Time to lose our company, said Ryan Mitchell as he unbuckled his belt, turned about, and crawled over his seat until he was standing in the open back of their rover, his hands resting on a machine gun mounted on the vehicle's roll bar. Quickly, he pulled back on the charging lever and loaded a round from the belt already inside the GPMG. With his shoulder jammed tight into the butt of the weapon, Mitchell aimed it squarely at the cab of the Humvee behind them. The driver of the Humvee saw Mitchell and tried swerving from side to side, but with the thick jungle on either side of the narrow dirt road, he had nowhere to go. Mitchell slightly lowered the weapon's sight and let loose a long burst of 7.62mm rounds into the engine block of the Humvee. Within seconds, steam and black, oily smoke rose from the stricken engine. The vehicle lurched forward, slowed, and finally stopped moving altogether, a cloud of steam blocking it from view. When he saw that the vehicle was no longer a threat, Mitchell jumped back into his seat. He could see the lead Humvee trying to get away, but the awful road conditions combined with Jackson's driving skills meant that they were not going to escape that easily. Now what, said Jackson. Mitchell slammed home a fresh 30-round magazine into his M4 rifle. I don't know. I honestly hadn't thought that far ahead, he replied dryly. Wonderful, Jackson muttered under his breath as he changed gears and floored the gas pedal, narrowing the distance between the vehicles. What the hell is going on? Who are those people? screamed Teplov at his perplexed driver. I don't know, sir, the young man replied. Jen squirmed around in her seat. Looking out the rear window, she watched the vehicle in question racing at them, like a lion chasing down its prey. She had no idea who they were, but for the first time since this nightmare had begun, Jen dared to hope that she might be saved. Pull up beside them, I'll try to shoot out their tires, said Mitchell, as he raised the M4 to his shoulder. Jackson shook his head, this was something that was easier said than done, and then only in the movies. 
Edging up, Jackson brought Mitchell in line with the rear driver's side tire and held his breath. Mitchell took quick aim and fired off a three-round burst into the tire. The sturdy tire did not shred, but started to leak air. Mitchell signaled to Jackson to speed up so he could shoot the driver's tires, when the loud pinging sound of automatic gunfire hitting the back of their rover caught their attention. Pivoting around in his seat, Mitchell was surprised to see the battered Humvee they had smashed off the road speeding up behind them. He'd hoped they had dealt with them in one blow, but it was not to be. God damn it, said Jackson, bobbing and weaving in his seat while bullets whistled past him. He jammed his foot down on the gas, sped up and shot past. The lead Humvee, intending to use it as a shield. Think of something, will you, Ryan? We need to ditch that other vehicle, and fast. Mitchell looked over his shoulder and smiled to himself. Pressing his throat mic, Mitchell gave a quick set of orders to the UAV operator who was watching the struggle on his computer from their base camp, and settled back down in his seat. Mind telling me what you're thinking, Captain, said Jackson, struggling. To keep their battered vehicle on the bumpy road. I hope UAVs aren't too expensive, said Mitchell, as the shadow of their UAV suddenly raced over them like a massive bird of prey. A second later, the damaged Humvee exploded in a bright orange fireball, as the UAV smashed straight through the windshield. The general is gonna be pissed when he hears what you did, said Jackson, slowing down as he tried to force the last Humvee off the road. He can bill whoever these people are working for, replied Mitchell, once more unbuckling his belt and crawling back to the machine gun. Mitchell's patience was growing thin, the shot tire was not deflating fast enough for him. He fired a short burst into the Humvee's hood, right away, the vehicle started to slow down. Keeping pace with the Humvee, Jackson braked and pulled over beside it, leaving plenty of room between Mitchell and his target. With the GPMG aimed at the driver's compartment, the driver's door to the Humvee slowly opened, and an AK was dropped unceremoniously onto the dirt. Road. Show us your hands, said Mitchell, keeping the machine gun trained on. The vehicle. A pair of shaking hands emerged from behind the door. Good. Now get out, slowly, ordered Mitchell. The driver, shaking in fear, stepped out of the vehicle, his eyes wide as he stared over at the weapon trained on his chest. Lie down, said Mitchell firmly, leaving no doubt in his voice that he meant business. Nodding, the driver got down on the road and lay there. Jackson grabbed his M4, chambered around, and hauled his heavy set frame out of the rover. He stood silently, eyeing the vehicle. You inside. Play it smart, let the girl go and slowly step out of the vehicle, said Mitchell. Don't do anything foolish. I'd fill you with a ton of lead before you could grab a weapon. Teplov sat there silently, staring out of the open driver's side door at the people who had ruined his plans. Get out, said Teplov to Jen, his voice bitter with defeat. Jen slowly opened her door, showed her hands like the driver had, and stepped out of the back of the Humvee. A feeling of relief washed over her the instant she stepped out of the vehicle. Okay, miss, now keep it calm, and slowly walk over beside me, said Jackson to Jen, never taking his eyes off the Humvee. Jen nodded and walked over beside Jackson. The African-American man was built like a defensive lineman in the NFL, and easily dwarfed Jen's more diminutive figure. Now you, ordered Mitchell to Teplov. Throw out any weapons you have, and crawl out through the open driver's side door. Make any sudden moves, and I promise that I'll turn you into Swiss cheese. A moment later, a pistol dropped out of the Humvee. Mitchell could hear a string of Russian curse words as the last occupant of the vehicle emerged. Standing there with his hands by his sides, he stared defiantly at Mitchell and Jackson. Mitchell lowered the machine gun, grabbed his M4, jumped down from the rover, and walked toward the Humvee. He looked at the imposing, solid frame and cold, uncaring eyes of the man standing in front of him and knew he was dealing with a professional, and not one of the local criminals they had already clashed with today. 
Okay, mister, hands on your head, and slowly get down on your knees, said Mitchell, as he waved at the dirt with his rifle barrel. With a look of disgust on his face, Teplov reluctantly did as he was told. Mitchell carefully walked forward, picked up the discarded pistol, and then, before Teplov knew what was happening, Mitchell pushed him onto the ground and slapped a set of handcuffs on him. Mitchell left Teplov in the dirt and joined Jackson and Jen. Are you all right? He asked Jen, putting a reassuring smile on his face. Yes, I guess so, replied Jen, looking at the men dressed in U.S. military. Fatigues who had just saved her life. Who are you guys? Are you with the army? Jackson let out a little chuckle. No, miss, we're not with the army, at least, not anymore, said Mitchell, as he offered his hand. Where are my manners? My name is Ryan, Ryan Mitchell, and this mountain of a man standing beside me is Nathaniel Jackson. Nate, said Jackson, in a deep, booming voice while offering his large hand in greeting. Jen shook both men's hands. She studied Mitchell for a long moment, her attention caught by his intense, blue-gray eyes. He and Nate were both over six feet tall, but Ryan was trim and athletic, in contrast to the other man's broad frame and muscular arms. She could tell by Ryan's tanned skin that he was a man who spent a lot of his life outdoors. She thought that Mitchell had a rugged, confident air about him, which she suspected women liked. Belatedly, Jen realized that she was staring, and looked away. Ryan's friend, Nate, cleared his throat, and Jen started. Her head was obviously somewhere up in space. She focused her attention on both men once again. I'm sorry, I'm not thinking straight. My name is Jennifer March, but please call me Jen. Jen it is, then. Mitchell smiled at her before stepping to one side. He pressed his throat mic, Yuri, send a sit rep. Yuri, their UAV operator, quickly. Filled him in on what was going on. In the distance, a police car with its siren. Blaring sped down the dirt track, leaving a red dust cloud behind it. Cavalry's coming, said Jackson dryly. Better late than never, replied Mitchell. He took in the worried look on Jen's face. Don't worry about your friends, they're safe, he said, caught on the sight of Jen's alluring, deep brown eyes. Tears welled up in Jen's eyes at the news. How do you know that? It's a case of dumb luck, really, but Nate and I and several others were over here helping to train the Philippine National Police's latest counterterrorism unit, and by pure accident, we spotted several vehicles heading in the direction of your camp. Yuri, my UAV operator wanted to show off his new toy to the class, so he followed the convoy until they stopped short of your dig site. When we saw armed men jumping out of the back of several Humvees, we knew it wasn't going to be a friendly house call. Nate and I decided to come after you. While the remainder of my training team, under the command of the Philippine counterterrorism team leader, swung in via chopper. It went from a training exercise into a live-fire confirmation in real short order. Jen wiped the tears from her cheeks, smudging red dirt across her face. Mitchell smiled and handed Jen his bandana. A police cruiser came to a sliding halt beside the Humvee. Two officers got out. Mitchell filled them in on what had happened. Grabbing Teplov by the arms, the police dragged him away and placed him in the back of their car before speeding off back the way they came. So, shall we take you back to your camp, said Mitchell to Jen. Yes, thank you, said Jen, more composed now that her tormentor was gone. Ten minutes later, Jackson turned off the mud-filled road and headed toward a group of Philippine special police, who were standing around with several overjoyed students. Alanis Kim saw Jen sitting in the front seat of Mitchell's vehicle. In an instant, fear changed to elation. She broke into tears as she ran forward and threw herself into Jen's arms. Both women sat there for a moment, not daring to let the other go for fear of losing one another again. Mitchell and Jackson left Jen alone with Kim, 
and together they walked over to a small, young, Asian woman dressed in similar fatigues to theirs. She was busy helping dress the wound on an injured local. Samantha Chen was the team medic, but she was just as deadly with a rifle as any man on the team. Sam, as she preferred to be called, stood just over five feet tall, with a petite, but firm, build. Her dark brown eyes burned with a passion to be the best at everything. She did. A former airborne medic, she was a professed adrenaline junkie and loved to free climb and parachute whenever she could. Standing beside Sam was a tall, slender man with a thick, black goatee. Gordon Cardinal, a Canadian from the West Coast Rockies, was the team's sniper and surveillance expert. Where Sam was excitable, Cardinal was as cool as a mountain glacier, nothing ever seemed to faze him. While relationships in their business were generally frowned upon, Mitchell turned a blind eye to Sam and Cardinal's blossoming romance. He reasoned that if he did not see it, he did not know about it. Besides, with the horrific things they saw and dealt with on a regular basis, a little companionship could be a really good thing. How did it go? Mitchell asked Cardinal. Smooth, really smooth, he replied. We were on them before they had a chance to kill them all. They're actually quite good, Sam said of the police special unit. Not a single terrorist got away. Unfortunately, five people were killed before we got here. Mitchell reached out and squeezed her arm. We did the best we could. There are many people alive here today because of what we, and especially our police counterparts, did. We should be proud of ourselves. Sam smiled and went back to her work. The adrenaline that had built up in his system slowly left Mitchell's body, making him start to feel fatigued. He slung his rifle over his shoulder, and decided to check on Jen one last time before rounding up his team and heading back to their camp. As he wandered through the compound, students and locals alike came up and shook his hand. This was not normal, Mitchell's people usually did their work in the shadows, without notice, and without thanks. In his mind, he reasoned that he and his team were simply doing their job. Mitchell and Jackson had known each other for years, serving on numerous deployments to Afghanistan together. Both former U.S. Army Rangers, they had recently been enticed to leave the service and come to work in the world of private security. Reticent at first, both men decided to take a leap of faith and retire from the Army to a more stable life that paid far better than the military ever could when Jackson's eldest son got into trouble with a local street gang during his last deployment. Mr. Mitchell, Mr. Mitchell, called Jen from behind a growing gaggle of police and students. Mitchell walked toward her. A bright, warm smile on her face greeted him. I'm glad that you found me. I wanted to see how you were doing, said Mitchell. It's not every day that a person gets kidnapped. I'm doing quite well, thanks to you, Mr. Mitchell, and Mr. Jackson, replied Jen. Please, call me Ryan. Okay then, Ryan. We will be leaving soon, but I was wondering when. You might be heading back to the States, and what your plans might be when you get back home, asked Mitchell. Jen looked into Mitchell's eyes and instantly knew that this was a man she could trust. She realized she was staring again. The phrase, keep it casual, flashed in her mind like an alarm. We've been told by the police that they are going to leave some men with us tonight, but we have to wrap up our dig by tomorrow morning and head back to Manila for a flight out of the country. Prudent move, it's not too safe around here, not after what happened today. No, I guess not. Mitchell canted his head. You still haven't said what you plan to do when you get back to the States. Jen smiled at Mitchell's attention. Why, Mr. Mitchell, are you trying to ask me out? The thought just came to me. It may seem a bit forward, but in my line of work hesitation never pays off, Mitchell said with his own smile. I know. Several good restaurants in New York City, if you were interested in some fine dining. And it's Ryan, please. Jen smiled back. I would love that, Ryan, 
but I happen to be living with my mother in Charlotte, North Carolina, right now. Good thing I know several excellent restaurants there as well, said Mitchell, not backing down. Jen felt out of sorts, first a kidnapping, and now a man she just met was asking for a date in the middle of the jungle. There was no way she could explain this one to her mother. Okay, you win, dinner when I get home. Now, how will I get in touch with you? Mitchell dug out his wallet and handed her a business card. Jen took the card and studied it for a moment. Then she tapped it against her chin. Ryan, there's one thing I don't understand. Why did they choose me? Why was I kidnapped? There are people here who are worth millions. Mitchell shrugged. I wish I had an answer for you, but I don't know. Perhaps the police will find out when they interrogate their prisoner. Until then, try to put it out of your mind. They made their farewells, and Jen watched him fade into a crowd of milling soldiers. A smile broke across her face. She suddenly felt alive, hoping that her heart was not going to take her down the wrong path again. Could tell that Mitchell was unlike any man she had ever met before in her life. Jen stood there for a long moment, knowing that she could not wait until they met again. Chapter 5 The yacht, Imperator the Black Sea the Small, Red, MD-500 helicopter flew through the hot afternoon sky, cruising along a thousand meters above the dark, blue-green sea, easily doing 200 kilometers an hour. The pilot had yet to push the small, but versatile, craft to its limits. Sitting stone-faced beside the pilot was an attractive woman in her late twenties. Pale, almost porcelain white skin and long, black hair gave her the look of a model. The pilot, a blonde-haired, ex-Russian police chopper pilot in his mid-forties, had picked up the woman from a private airstrip just outside of Istanbul. He was under strict orders not to talk to his passenger, and that suited him fine. Most people talked too much for his liking, however, this one looked almost statue-like, sitting there, saying nothing, doing nothing, just staring straight ahead, and ignoring the world flying past beneath her. The silence may have been welcome, but for some indefinable reason, her presence made the pilot quite uncomfortable. The sooner he landed and was rid of his passenger, the better it would be. He knew from his flight briefing that this was going to be a quick visit followed immediately by a return flight straight back to the private airstrip, where a Learjet was waiting on standby. All he had to do was fly the helicopter, keep his mouth shut, forget his passenger was ever in his helicopter, and an easy $50,000 was his. A minute later, the luxury yacht Imperator emerged like a welcoming island on the blue horizon. Relief flooded through the pilot. He wanted this task over with as soon as possible. He quickly radioed the ship that he had their guest, and banked to the right so he could align his helicopter with the massive boat's rear helipad. At 120 meters in length, the Imperator was the fifth largest luxury yacht in the world. Crewed by 40, it could comfortably accommodate 20 guests at a time in the most lavish rooms imaginable. 4. Its rich occupants and visitors, it had all the usual features such as an indoor theater, two heated pools, and a huge dining room, along with many additional unseen defensive measures such as black market, Russian-made, ship-to-air missiles, a mini-sub, and the latest in surveillance and mine detection systems. This vessel did not want to be bothered. Dmitry Romanov watched silently on the ship's closed surveillance system as the helicopter came in and landed on the deck. At 55 years of age, he was a man at the height of his game. The heir presumptive to the long vacant Russian throne, Romanov claimed that he could trace his family lineage as far back as the beginning of the House of Romanov in 1613. His family had lived in Paris ever since the Russian Revolution in 1917. Recently, however, Romanov had decided to move back to the land of his ancestors, and had bought land outside of Moscow, upon which he had built a palatial mansion where his family could live. He had always known affluence and prestige, his father was a wealthy executive who died when Romanov was in his teens. Although young, 
Romanov quickly took over the reins of his father's business. Driven by an insatiable desire for wealth and power, he was a multimillionaire by age. 18, and a billionaire before he turned 30, with offices and holdings all over the world. Oil and natural gas were the two commodities that Romanov continually sought. If they were out there, hidden deep underground, he seemed to know where to look, and never let anyone or anything get in his way. His shares of companies involved in oil exploration in Russia and West Africa were unmatched, his profits soared by the day. He rarely traveled anywhere except aboard his yacht, safe and secure from his rivals and the prying eyes and ears of many a hostile power. He had short, black hair, along with a neatly trimmed circle goatee, both always immaculately kept. Romanov was by choice a vegetarian, this, combined with his avid love of swimming, kept him trim and in outstanding shape. Today, he was casually dressed in a pair of white slacks, with a blue and white striped, nautical-looking, short-sleeved shirt. His bright, cognac-brown eyes burned with an intensity that showed his razor-sharp intellect and an unparalleled drive to dominate and control the world around him. A young woman in her late twenties dressed in a snug teal jumpsuit quietly entered the high-tech office and walked over beside Romanov. She easily stood six feet tall, and anyone admiring her physique would see that she, like her father, was fanatical about her physical condition. Her face was angular, with deep-set, hazel-colored eyes. The young woman's long, black hair was tied in a ponytail that went halfway down her muscular back. She was unmistakably her father's daughter. Is she really back so soon, asked the girl, as she peered up at the screen, watching as the helicopter doors were opened by two of Romanov's well-armed security personnel. She pursed her lips and took in a deep breath as she intently watched her twin sister, equally attired in a jumpsuit, this one tan, as she stepped onto the ship's deck. Yes, my dear Alexandra, your sister Nika is home, replied Romanov, lovingly patting his daughter's well-manicured hand. Alexandra and Nika Romanov were identical twins. They not only looked alike, but they also always dressed alike. Thousands of kilometers could separate them, yet they would always arrive on time, dressed in exactly the same outfit, just in different colors. This was the only way that their parents could tell them apart as children. She looks tired, said Alexandra, as she watched her sister slowly climb down a set of metal stairs leading the helipad. Don't worry too much. I am sure that your sister has done her part and has obtained what we are looking for, said Romanov. Alexandra watched as her sister walked, under escort, from the helipad, through the main deck of the yacht, toward her father's office, located in the luxurious aft lower level. Father, are you sure we are not pushing things too? Fast, asked Alexandra, moving behind her father's tall, antique, 18th century wooden chair. Alexandra, my dear, this is not like you. You are starting to make me nervous, said Romanov, reaching up and lightly squeezing his daughter's soft, pale-skinned hand. Your sister is the most resourceful person I know at obtaining, how would you say, the unobtainable. If she is back, then she has the missing pieces of the puzzle with her. Alexandra looked down at her father and smiled at him. Perhaps I am being overly melodramatic, but please remember, father, we are risking everything we own on this venture, and I for one won't relax until we have what is rightfully ours. Your mother would be proud of the women you have both become, but, Alexandra, you worry too much, my dear, it's truly not good for you. Cancer had killed Tamara Romanov, the girl's mother, ten years prior. Alexandra, the more pragmatic of the twins, had taken over the role of family matriarch, and looked after her father and his business affairs with cold efficiency. Seconds later, there was a knock. The door to Romanov's office slowly opened, and one of his impeccably dressed security guards entered the room. Sorry to intrude, sir, I have your daughter waiting outside the door, said the guard. Very good, show her in, said Romanov. The guard opened the door and politely waited for Nika to enter the room. 
With a slight nod to the guard, Nika strode into the room, locking eyes with her father. Her twin sister was standing behind him, like an eagle waiting to pounce on some poor field mouse. She quickly scanned the room and, with an unconcealed smirk, she noticed that her father had extensively redecorated since she was last aboard. There were several new Van Goghs and Rembrandts adorning the walls, along with four ancient Chinese vases from what Nika suspected was the 3rd or 4th century. The magnificence of the room was designed deliberately to awe Romanov's guests, but all it elicited from Nika was a bored, indifferent shrug. Money and material gains no longer interested her. She now only lived for the rush that came with her high-risk lifestyle. Nika always knew that she would die young and yet, somehow, deep down inside her cold heart, she welcomed it. Romanov saw the uncaring look in his daughter's unemotional brown eyes and realized with a heavy heart that he was losing her. Ever since her unfaithful husband's death from an overdose last year, his beloved Nika had embarked on a self-destructive path. Until now, he had been able to manage it, but seeing them. Lost look in her eyes, Romanov knew things were getting worse. He smiled. Warmly and wrapped his arms around her. He gave her a long hug followed by a quick kiss on each cheek. Please, my beloved, please come in and take a seat, said Romanov, as the guard pulled out an ornately carved chair that had once belonged to Louis XIV of France for her. Nika sat and looked up at her father. I am sorry to say it, father, but I cannot stay long, said Nika, with an accent that, like her sister's, was a mix of French and Russian. Darling, please reconsider, replied Romanov, perplexed at his daughter's behavior. My dear, we haven't seen you for months, and now you are already planning to leave. Please, say you will stay at least for one night. No, father, I cannot. In fact, I need to be on my way shortly, if I am going to make my next appointment in the States, replied Nika. She reached into a pocket, pulled out her silver cigarette case, removed one, and lit it. Nika knew. Her father had never smoked a day in his life and thoroughly detested the smell of it, but she did not care, she needed a smoke, and that was all there was to it. Alexandra could see the game her sister was playing, and she shot her sister a look that said, back off now, or else. Nika saw the expression on her sister's face, shrugged, and ignored her. Romanov saw what was happening. He struggled to smile. Nika, my dearest, please reconsider and stay, he said, his voice almost pleading. Nika removed the smoldering cigarette from her lips and crushed it in an ornate and expensive-looking china cup on the table. Both Alexandra and her father winced at this latest display of rebellion. Alexandra's blood was boiling. How dare her sister act so disrespectfully in front of their father. If you are not going to bless us with a visit, said Alexandra, her words dripping with venom, then please tell us, what is so important that you had to fly here to tell us, only to have to leave right away. Later, said Nika. Romanov watched his daughters as they verbally sparred with one another. He never said it aloud, but he had always encouraged his daughters to be competitive, even with each other. It was the only way to survive in the real world. People would use you up and spit you out if you did not learn to use them first. Nika slowly slid open a zipper on her breast pocket, and pulled out a small green memory stick, which she carefully laid on the table in front of her. Alexandra reached over and snatched it up, examining it. She was not surprised to see that it was marked top secret, and had come from the South African Ministry of Defense. So, what did you have to do to obtain this little gem, asked Alexandra, as she eyed her sister. Not too much, said Nika, as she poured herself a tall glass of ice-cold water. It was remarkably easy. I appealed to the loneliness of a very young and forlorn corporal far from home, who also happened to work in the computer section located deep inside the South African Ministry of Defense. He was instantly smitten by me and, after a few days of toying with him, I simply had him download the information that I was looking for. What about the corporal? asked Romanov. 
Oh, he had an unfortunate accident. They fished his bloated body from the Juxkai River yesterday, said Nika, without a hint of remorse in her voice. Most unfortunate for the young man, said Alexandra dismissively, as if. They were talking about the weather. Love can be fatal, said Nika with a cold smile, as she poured herself another glass of water. A sudden thought occurred to Romanov. Perhaps Nika's husband was helped along with his suicide, he was not putting anything past his daughter these days. With a forced smile, he asked, what are the chances his theft of key defense information will be discovered? Nil, absolutely none, Nika said. The late corporal uploaded a virus that I provided to him after he had downloaded the information that I needed. It will take their IT experts weeks to debug their system, and by then the files will be horribly corrupted. The theft will go unnoticed for weeks, by then it will, of course, all be too late for anyone to do anything about it. Romanov smiled at his daughter's ingenuity. Have you looked at the files? asked Alexandra, her voice suddenly trembling with anticipation as she spoke. Oh, most definitely, everything, and I do mean everything, is on that memory stick. Father, all you have to do is give the go-ahead to Colonel Chang, and what you seek will be yours, said Nika. Romanov said nothing. He stared proudly at Nika and turned to face Alexandra. Take the stick and download all the information onto our secure computers. Make sure you encrypt it before sending it on to Colonel Chang. Let him know that he can back brief me via video teleconference on his plan to secure the packages tomorrow morning at 1000 hours. Alexandra nodded, picked up the stick, and placed it in her pocket for safekeeping. Nika, you have done wonderfully, said Romanov. Since you have taken the time to personally deliver this truly wonderful news to us, why do you have to leave? Father, I have an entirely reliable source in the US that has provided me with information that the American woman your people failed to grab in the Philippines will be back home tomorrow night, said Nika, as she swirled the ice around in her crystal glass. Romanov smiled. Do you think you can get your hands on her? Nika locked eyes with her father. Have I ever failed you, said Nika. No, not once, my dear, Romanov said, as he patted his daughter's hand. Nika stood. Now, I have wasted too much time already. I must be going. She wrapped her arms around her father, looked over at her sister, and shot her a smug, almost taunting, self-righteous smile. Romanov and Alexandra stood there, watching, as Nika exited the room and was escorted to the waiting helicopter. When she arrived on the helipad, Nika turned to the nearest camera and playfully waved goodbye, just before climbing into the passenger door of the helicopter. Romanov shook his head at his daughter's increasingly unpredictable behavior, before sitting down in his favorite leather chair. Reaching into his Leather briefcase, he pulled out an iPad and opened it to today's New York Times. The headline read, Another deadly week of unrest sweeps Moscow, can President Ivankov survive? He smiled to himself and thought about the revolution he was secretly financing. These zealots are creating more havoc than I had truly hoped for when we initially agreed to support them and their foolish uprising, said Romanov to Alexandra. He was genuinely impressed with the chaos and carnage sown by the latest bombing at an army barracks on the outskirts of Moscow. Alexandra looked over her father's shoulder at the news headline, a crooked smile crept across her face. The current Russian government is nothing more than a glorified dictatorship. It will naturally overreact and crack down even harder on the rebels, causing more disenfranchised people to turn to them, thereby creating the opportunity for someone willing to take the chance to lead Russia and her people out of this mess. Like a cat, Alexandra slinked over and sat down beside her father. As I planned, father, we only need to keep the West's intelligence agencies focused away from what is really going to occur. The plan is pure genius in its simplicity. 
I have it from well-placed and highly reliable sources that your name is already being whispered on the lips of some very nervous Chinese, Japanese, and European officials as the possible savior of Russia and their precious supply of oil and natural gas. Your well-cultivated, pro-Western stance and proven track. Record as a formidable global business leader make you their white knight in. Shining armor. They are all fools who have become addicted to the cheap oil and gas I have been selling them. Most assuredly, Father. I expect that by the end of next week, the West will be begging you to step in and become the de facto ruler of Russia. As it should be, the House of Romanov will resume its rightful place as the leader of the nation. This is all truly excellent news. Now, all we need is the right catalyst, and we will be richer and more powerful than any family in the history of the world. Alexandra, do you think Chong and his band of overly well-paid mercenaries can pull this off? Asked Romanov. If Nika is right, and the information contained on the memory stick is 100% accurate, then Colonel Chong is the man to do it. After all, he does not come cheap. People like him care more about their reputations than anything else. He will deliver what we are after. Romanov smiled and lovingly patted his daughter's hand. You and your sister truly do make me proud. Alexandra smiled at her father as she stood, removed the memory stick from her pocket, and rolled it around in her hand for a moment. She wondered to herself what their world would look like in a matter of weeks. Snapping herself back into the here and now, she strode out of her father's office, leaving him alone with his thoughts.